Good morning all and welcome to Registrar presentation for this week. I'm Sean and today I'll be presenting on gunshot wounds. So firstly, gunshot wounds and ballistic trauma are a potential cause of severe morbidity and mortality, especially given the original design purpose of firearms. Thankfully in Australia, our rate of seeing these injuries is relatively low due to the combination of our culture and our laws. They are a very heterogeneous set of injuries as the nature of the injury and the consequences for the patient really depends on the path the projectile takes through the body and the energy that's transferred to those tissues along the way. One of the challenges for guiding management is the limited scientific literature available and that a lot of the research over the last 20 years has come from the combat environment where there are quite different considerations to the civilian hospital system. Injuries have been classically classified by the velocity of the projectile. This is due to the exponential association between velocity and energy. However, this does oversimplify the matter as heavier or differently constructed projectiles can compensate for a slower speed and cause similarly large tissue destruction. The greatest area of difference is the ability for higher velocity injuries to cause tissue stretch and destruction further away from their path through a temporary wound cavity and the way some projectiles fragment and cause harm further from their original tract. This is a simplified depiction of wounding potential for various firearms. One of the key depictions here is the concept of a temporary versus a permanent wound cavity. The permanent cavity is the darker central area of each projectile's tract, reflecting more crushing and tearing of tissue. Around that is the temporary tract where hydrostatic pressure waves through the tissue contribute to stretching and disruption with less absolute destruction. However, any of these are again simplifications as the wound caused will vary with range. As projectiles slow down over distance, their destructive capacity decreases. Wounding potential also varies significantly with projectile construction. These are ballistic gelatin depictions of the wound tract that might be created by two very similar projectiles. Both are handgun rounds weighing the same amount and with similar muzzle velocities, well within that low velocity classification. However, the different constructions mean that the upper bullet expands rapidly dumping its energy into the target within the first four inches and will cause massive injury within that zone. In contrast, the lower bullet, not capable of expanding, zips through that first five to six inches as a very small hole, causes more damage from about six to 18 inches as it tumbles, and then causes a very minor wound tract further along. This means that while the upper bullet could strike, for example, an arm and be quite explosive in its wounding potential, the lower bullet could strike a victim in the arm similarly and be out the other side before it causes much damage. These are ballistic gel depictions of high velocity bullet impacts. These two are bullets that might be fired from many common Western military service rifles or common hunting rifles. They're again similar weight projectiles traveling at similar speeds and again, differences in construction change their effect on the victim. Again, the upper one dumps its energy into whatever tissue is struck very early on, while the lower one travels further, leaving a small hole early on until it fragments and causes much more destruction. On the right is a chart showing the velocity of a similar projectile to these and the corresponding energy. This clearly demonstrates how the wounding potential from the same weapon will be drastically changed by the range. The clear comparison here though, is the total amount of tissue destruction that can occur well away from the center of the tract, especially comparing the high velocity to the low velocity wounds. Ultimately, one of the takeaways from all of this is the need to treat the wound based on what you see in the patient, rather than approaching it with any kind of rigid belief about what may have happened. As we've seen, low velocity and lower energy wounds cause less tissue damage and morbidity. This individual had been struck by a low energy bullet where the ulna was able to deflect the bullet without a fracture and instead the bullet fragmented 
they were cared for with wound exploration, debridement and removal of the large fragment, a short course of oral antibiotics and local wound care. Residual lead particles in this individual were not involving joints or neurovascular structures, hence they could safely be left in situ. There is a brief gall warning before we move to the next slide. So shotgun wounds can also behave in a variety of ways, depending on the range, the choice of the round, and even within the wound tract. This picture is from a patient with a shotgun wound to the shoulder. There's clearly immense shallow destruction and we would expect plastics to need to be involved from the start. This wound would clearly require significant exploration and debridement, multiple trips to the operating theatre, challenges with soft tissue coverage, and would have to expect there to be periarticular pellets. The ballistics gel below demonstrates an early shallow tract with wide and moderately deep tissue destruction, followed by the pellets spreading out and causing a large number of low velocity style wound tracts through the tissue. On the lower left here, the wad is identified. This is another element which may cause morbidity. It's a typically plastic component which travels with the shot in the early stages and may lodge in the wound to form a focus of infection. However, being plastic, it's radiolucent and may be missed if it's not known about and looked for. This radiograph is from an extremely close range hunting rifle accident where the projectile has fragmented and caused catastrophic damage. While the projectile diameter may have been similar to that in the low velocity wound, here being 0.27 of an inch versus previously 0.22, the energy transfer was completely different. This required management with debridement, vascular repair, damage control orthopedics with an antibiotic spacer, and multiple trips to theatre. Ultimately, salvage was via an amputation. As we can see here, the fragmentation of hunting rounds can make removal of all metal debris impossible. In the combat setting, the Hague Conventions limit bullet construction, intending to limit this destruction for humanitarian reasons and make medical care of soldiers easier. However, a lot of countries stretch the definitions that are used to achieve the lethality that militaries seek. All of this again combines to suggest we should ultimately treat the wound as we see it and be guided to an extent by a first principles approach of assessing the wounds. The science around management appears more protocol driven and retrospective evidence based rather than guided by any particularly high quality evidence. Ultimately, we have a trauma patient who may be unstable and an EMST driven primary and secondary survey is required. Once the patient's been stabilized, an algorithm such as the one on the right from JOS may be utilized to guide management. Each wound and patient needs to be treated on their own merits based on the involved damaged tissues, key structures or fractures. As we know, Patients die because their brain stops or their heart stops. If a gunshot wound hasn't caused immediate death through neuraxial trauma, then there may not actually be that much required to provisionally stabilise a patient. Bilateral chest tubes are relatively commonly used as the temporary wound cavity or secondary missiles from bone or bullet fragments can damage both hemithoraces. Gunshot wounds to the thorax obviously have the potential to damage a wide variety of internal organs and a laparotomy may be required. There are relatively clear guidelines for exploratory laparotomy and the early decision points for these include hemodynamic instability, peritonism, large volumes of free fluid or multiple abdominal wounds. While the orthopedic team may not be directly involved here, we do play a key role in the trauma management and should have situational awareness of how the patient is going to be kept alive. Compartment syndrome is seen post gunshot wound and is often associated with fracture, increased soft tissue injury or vascular injury. Diagnosis and management remains unchanged from compartment syndrome from other mechanisms. Our index of suspicion, however, may be increased with the mechanism or the location of the fracture, 
However, the literature I could find remains relatively limited. As noted here, proximal fractures of the forearm are more commonly associated with compartment syndrome. Catastrophic hemorrhage remains a significant cause of mortality, particularly amongst soldiers and particularly for avoidable deaths. This pattern is different from the civilian population of gunshot wounds, in part due to the truncal protection afforded by military body armour. There's a strong training push towards the use of tourniquets in the early stage of casualty care, and evidence suggests that vascular shunts and other basic vascular interventions can provide limb-saving care in the forward hospital. Vascular injury may be seen through direct injury and the permanent wound cavity, secondary missiles from fracture fragments or bone or bullet fragments, or indirect injury from the temporary wound cavity and tissue deformation. Particularly in this third grouping, the vessel may remain in continuity but have intimal or endothelial disruption from stretching or focal vasospasm may occur. A detailed vascular examination is essential upon arrival with the use of operative exploration in cases of definitive findings, while assessments such as an ankle brachial index or angiography can be utilised if there is clinical concern or asymmetric findings. Nerve injury is most often indirect through stretch through the temporary wound cavity, leading to neuropraxia. Nerve laceration is less common, with some papers reporting 17-27% to 27 of explored upper limb nerves being lacerated. There is some variation in the literature whether nerve injury should be explored or observed, and some papers report improved outcomes with early exploration, which they typically defined as less than four months. Spontaneous recovery is seen in the majority of patients, consistent with a neuropraxia mechanism, with some studies reporting up to a 70% rate of spontaneous recovery. What I was unable to find was guidance to improve outcomes for that other 30%, and I do suspect that early assessment with techniques such as ultrasound may help guide earlier intervention while nerve repair techniques may be more viable. Gunshot wounds with spinal involvement are a relatively common cause of traumatic spinal injury, and they have clear indications for surgical intervention. Of note, if a patient has stable and complete neurological deficits, there currently appears to be no evidence to support operating just for this, and of course, operating would be associated with complications. If a patient presents with one of these listed issues, then surgical intervention is appropriate. Another key feature is, the, is that cervical spine gunshot wounds have very high rates of airway compromise, while the rates of C-spine instability are relatively low at only 4 to 30%. Hence, we should certainly ensure we protect the airway even without definitive C-spine clearance as per standard EMST protocols. Gunshot wound tracts have been proven to be non-sterile throughout their entirety. However, there is limited evidence to guide management and local protocols and antibiotic choices guided by local sensitivities do appear to predominate. A protocol similar to the Gustillo classification is commonly referenced with the use of first generation cephalosporins for the Gustillo 1 and 2 type injuries and the addition of gentamicin for the Gustillo 3 type injuries. For those low energy wounds with no requirement for operative fracture management, infection rate can be as low as only 1 or 2%. High energy wounds may have an infection rate of over 40%. This is increased significantly up to 80% or so if the wound is closed primarily. This is due to the large amount of compromised tissue from these mechanisms and the inability to appropriately manage and debride this. Projectiles which travel through the abdomen and perforate the large bowel are the most often associated with infection. If a projectile ends up in or through a joint after penetrating the large bowel, this should be treated as a septic arthritis with a joint washout. Fractures may occur from direct impact of the bullet against bone or in smaller bones indirectly through the deformation of the temporary wound cavity.
The very presence of a fracture suggests a much higher energy transfer, as well as the potential for formation of secondary missiles from bone fragments or fragmentation of the bullet. As noted in the algorithm at the start, overall decision-making for fracture management and fixation comes back to the stability of the fracture. If that fracture wouldn't require fixation on its own merits, the mechanism alone isn't an indication to operate. Provisional fixation with external fixators to protect the soft tissues and allow serial debridement may well be appropriate in high energy injuries. Fractures caused by gunshot wounds may be more complex and challenging to fix due to increased comminution, greater soft tissue stripping and bone loss. External fixateurs may be used more commonly due to the magnitude of soft tissue injury. However, non-operative plate and nail fixation techniques have all been successfully used in the appropriate injuries. In areas of segmental bone loss, mass galay or bone transport techniques can be utilized once the soft tissues are stabilized and debridement is complete. One American retrospective study showed an increased rate of both delayed and non-union of fractures when total retained lead of within five millimeters of the fracture site was increased. This correlates with previous animal studies where increasing lead doses delayed and then ultimately inhibited fracture union. However, the limited quality of that study and the concerns of iatrogenic harm from increased dissection to remove fragments prevented them from recommending aggressive removal. They did suggest that these findings may alter your planning, such as extending the observation window of delayed unions to see if they would heal. Other papers do not suggest an increased rate of non-union specifically with open gunshot wound fractures, rather more so with significant soft tissue injuries requiring external fixation management. As seen in some of these radiographs, retained fragments may be widely spread and impossible to remove. Where fragments are large enough for removal, this is not required unless there are specific indications, some of which are outlined here. Perispinal or perineural bullets and fragments may need removal as outlined previously. An intra-articular bullet or fragment can lead to joint destruction, progressive fragmentation of the projectile and lead toxicity. Obviously, removal of the intact bullet in A would be much easier than the radical cytovectomy that would be required in B. The skin and muscle envelope is the most forgiving of the tissues involved in most gunshot wounds. The good blood supply, healing potential and relative ability to tolerate stretch means that they're best suited to recover whether this is in the zone of permanent or temporary wound cavities. Immediate primary closure is contraindicated due to infection risk and the inability to definitively assess viable versus non-viable tissue. After an initial debridement, wounds may be closed as a delayed primary closure or allowed to heal by secondary intention. Shotgun wounds or high velocity bullet wounds have the potential for large areas or volumes of tissue loss and plastic surgical input may be required once that true zone of injury has been demarcated with repeat debridement as required. Ultimately, the wound should be treated on its own merits with the mechanism primarily guiding our understanding of the tissue damage and underlying physics. So in conclusion, while this is currently a rare mechanism of injury in Australia, it is more common in other parts of the world where we may work during our careers. The soft tissue envelope, bones, neurovascular structures, and other organs and tissues all need to be assessed in a methodical way with an understanding of the physics of the wounding mechanism, but ultimately assessed on an individual basis. Given the potential for a single high energy wound to involve multiple systems and fractures, these patients will likely be best cared for in a dedicated trauma institution with access to plastics, vascular, orthopedics and general surgery, along with spine and pelvis capability. Bullets and fragments should be left alone unless there's a clear reason to take them out and consideration of the morbidity of chasing material needs to be assessed.
Many wounds can be managed non-operatively with minimal antibiotics and local wound care, while fracture management may range from non-operative through to complex reconstructive management of segmental defects. Here are some of the references and thank you for your time.